When it says it needs a Scion cartridge or printer, what's that mean? A what? C Y E M. It's a color, I think. Yeah, it it's a color. Color. Mm hmm well, I just replaced the black one in it and now it's wanting that one. What's that problem? I don't this period probably has them. Will the black work without it? No, it won't no. print. It's like ours. It, you got to have one free. You got to have all four of them in there. Hi out there, we're uh, broadcasting live at this point from uh, North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. I'm Melissa Tebow with the Distance Education Program here, and welcome to the revised Bloom's Taxonomy. Uh, with me today are two consultants from our Department of Public Instruction, Wieda Myers, who works with us, um, with, with us before with media specialists and instructional technologists, you may have uh, encountered her in the past, and Gail Holmes who is um, also in instructional technology and wears many, many hats. So I'm sure that, uh, that these folks are well known to people out in the field. And they're here to talk to you about the Bloom's Taxonomy. Can I, we're just for the point of housekeeping, it looks as though we're primarily um, engaged with video Oh, conferencing. yes I am. <laughs> Hello, Arrowwood, your audio's on. Thank you. All right. Um, Folks, we, we will have some interactive components to this particular presentation. If you have a computer in front of you and you want to try to follow along, that's great. Otherwise, the URLs for this particular activity and the PowerPoint that will be shared today will be available from the website and you can just click on the link. If someone could turn off their audio remotely, please. Um, we have, uh, there will be a link that will be available Then you can download the PowerPoint and use that in your own instruction. So I'll let these folks get started. They have a lot to talk to you about. Thank you so much for attending. Well, hello, how are you today? <laughs> and this is an interactive session, so I expect you to respond. <laughs> they need to put their audio on if they're gonna respond. So just give a wave if everybody can hear. Hey, there we go. <laughs> okay, well our session today, it will look at revised blooms through the standard course of study, and it will also look at strategies for aligning some resources. So we're going to get started by giving you a quick view of what we're going to cover. Some of the things that we're gonna talk about today are pedagogy, some online tools, the content, the important higher order thinking and Bloom's taxonomy, of course, and mastery learning. Just an overview, the session will focus on tools and resources that are again aligned to revise Bloom's and how these resources can be used to connect the content, the pedagogy, higher order thinking skills, and promote mastery learning. Again, this is an interactive session, so we're going to ask that 
you respond by raising your hands, giving us a thumbs up so that we'll know that you either have questions, you understand, or you're ready for us to move forward. It is our hope that when you leave today, you will be comfortable with some of the resources that we have shared, or if you have questions about some of the resources, you will ask and allow us time to kind of explain those tools so that you can go back and explore them in detail. If for some reason you know that the tools are blocked, again, let us know that these tools are not available in your districts and we will suggest some alternative tools. For those of you who have access to technology and would like to follow along with us, this information is contained on a wiki that you can find at http colon slash slash g h h o l m e s dot p this is peanut butter b works dot com from the task menu you will click on revise Bloom's taxonomy you can take this book this website back or this PowerPoint back and use it in your districts. It is again an interactive PowerPoint. So we're going to begin by asking you the question, how comfortable are you with embedding content, pedagogy, and technology when teaching? If you have access to a computer, you can click on the button and respond. If you don't have access, please raise your thumb as it relates to one of the categories that we're going to suggest to you. The first category is, the traditional way has worked for me in the past. Second category, I want to grow, but lack of resources is a problem. Third category, I have the tools, but I need help with the strategies for use. And fourth category. I'm well on my way, but I love attending sessions for continued growth. <laughs> so let's respond to one of those categories. Raise your thumb, or thumbs up, if the traditional way has worked for me in the past. You're not ready to move forward. Raise your thumb if B is what you'd like to select. If lack of resources is a problem for you. Problem. That's B. Okay. Arrowhead, you said B? <coughs> we had a B. Okay. Okay. C? You have the tools, but you need some strategies for how to use them. Okay, and the final one. I'm well on my way, but I just love attending sessions for continued growth. Looks like C, is it? Okay. Okay. So we'll try to focus our attention on meeting the goals of C. Did someone have a comment? I think that um, the, the audio is still on. Somebody needs to mute their microphone. Thank you. Still hear my Sam's That's right. Okay. We're good? She's gonna mute her microphone. She's trying. I would go ahead. So let's talk a little bit about what is preventing you from effectively embedding technology into your curriculum. They give people a minute, they can answer. Anybody have an answer? Can we hear an answer from each school? Primarily, we said time. Okay, so time. What other things? We often have dropping connections or not enough computers at a time, or we don't know how to teach a certain tool, such as Prezi is really big right now, and teaching that is difficult. Okay. What other issues?
Well, let's speak to those two issues. First of all, let's talk a little bit about time. Now, in considering not having enough time, management, we know, is a problem. We know that it's very difficult to teach that tool, find access to the technology to teach that tool. But if we move our strategies to a facilitator and understand that when we provide resources to students to use these tools, it doesn't have to necessarily be done in the classroom. A lot of the students will have access at home. A lot of the students will have access to after school. One of the things that I found helpful in the school that I worked in prior to working with DPI, I would have an open lab after school to allow students to come in and complete projects that teachers assigned. I want you to also consider this interactive PowerPoint that we're using, how you can use one computer in the classroom to get some feedback and at the same time manage the day-to-day -day tasks that you want students to complete. I want to ask a question. Have you heard anything about flipping homework? Raise your hand if you have. You know, you've heard about or shake your head. Okay. I'm into flipping PD. And so what that would mean is that you may have someone in your school district who's really good at a certain tool and they may create a tutorial page like on a wiki or a website and then become an expert at that tool and then share that. Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody has to become that expert. I've done several of those just in the evening when I sit around just doing geeky stuff. But um, you don't have to know a little bit more about that's what, who, what I do. But um, the other thing is, like you mentioned Prezi. Prezi has fabulous tools on the website. You go to the uh, and ask for the educator site, and there are things that you can go step by step, modify, but anyway, find someone who that's their tool they're interested in and let them share with. And the, I don't use it very much because I have to think about return on investment. What is it that I'm actually going to get for my time? And, you know, that may not be the thing, the tool that I need to use at the time. Um, I've got several things that maybe I've just copied from somebody, someone. In fact, I've got a really nice one that, I, that has a license that I can copy and make edits to about wikis. And it's a Prezi about telling all about how to use wikis. And it's created by Wikispaces. So anyway, there are things that are out there. And that's, I would say the professional development these days is not about sit and get. It's more about learning how to fish, learning how to find what you need, and going after it yourself, either with your, a partner or with someone else. But sitting around and learning how to do an application is probably not going to happen because we're focusing more on the content and how to use it within a content. So I hope that helps. And understand too that it's not about the tool. It is about the content. The, the tool is, just happens to be what you're going to use to share that information with your students or with your teachers. I do want to say though before we move on to that there was one activity where we wanted to do some professional development with teachers and we started out by doing 15-minute sessions during the day where they could just drop in for 15 minutes and attend a presentation on some tool or some strategy that we were going to share in the school. And we started that strategy with the teachers. And then we brought in students because we wanted to give some students some ownership. So we brought in students and the students began to present those workshops instead of the teachers. And what went so well was the fact that those students began to say, if my teacher were to assign this assignment, we could use this tool to do this, this, and this. And they began to connect that tool to the content. And that's what we want to see. We want to see student ownership. So let's move in then to revised blooms. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, interrupt just once here to say, Along those same lines about finding that right tool and working with the tools, think about how does that transfer into a work or a college? Is it something that's specific to learning a, and, and Gail's going to mention about the, some of the lower levels, is it a remembering tool? That's not really applicable and so I wouldn't spend a lot of time on that, but is there something that 
that you or students will use that are applicable in real world processes more than an application. How many of you have done work with revised balloons before? Raise your hand, Three. shake your hand. Three. Okay. Okay, then you will know that revised balloons is set up so that you have five verbs. You have remembering, you have understanding, and all these are on this PowerPoint I'm going to give you. You have applying, analyzing, creating, and evaluating. One of the places that you may have seen this, all of our new essential standards for North Carolina have been developed using the revised blooms. So you may have been come in contact with them that, without realizing it. These are your cognitive processes. It also, with revised blooms, has four knowledge dimensions. Those knowledge dimensions will determine what type of verb you're going to use when you are teaching a concept. For example, this is, this picture that you're seeing now, that's your lowest level. This is your factual level. So if I were using revised blooms with the factual level, if I were focusing on remembering, I may do things like have my students list something, or I might have them to recall something. For example, when I was in eighth grade, my teacher had us to memorize the Gettysburg Address. And I can still recite the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> but she had me, I made no connection to it. I didn't understand why I was doing it. And that's where the piece comes in where if you're teaching any concept, it is important for you to teach that kid or that, that student why it is you want them to learn that information. Because if they don't make any connections to it, they're just learning the information for the sake of learning it. So what could she have done for me to connect to that information so that it made meaning for me? How could I have taken that remembering level, which is the lowest level, and taken it to the create level? What kinds of things could she do. What kinds of things could you do now with the Gettysburg Address to connect it from remembering to create? Feedback. Okay, let's take it one step. Before we even get to create, let's look at understand. How could I understand? Bring it to the understand level. Maybe to rewrite it in your own words. Rewrite it in my, my own words. I'm going to summarize it. Very good. Okay, what's the next level? There's somebody else. Anybody else responding? <laughs> I can't, I didn't hear that. What was the response? Create a game. Or perhaps take pictures to. Uh, sequentially will play out on a specific event within the Gettysburg battle. Okay. Now, that's good. Let's work our way up now to create. How can I create? What kind of activity can I do with that create? What if my teacher had asked me to take that Gettysburg address and apply it to what was happening during that time period and rewrite a speech for the current president. Could that have been done? Think about the high order thinking skills that's required to do that. Think about the research that's involved. And that's where we want to take our students. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that remember, understand, analyze, apply, and evaluation should be thrown out the window. But we want mastery learning. Facts are important. It was important for me to learn that Gettysburg Address. But equally as important 
is it for them to teach me how to apply that knowledge to real life situations. What are some examples of an effective use of remembering? When is remembering the task that is the most important? When you're New content. When you when you're teaching students, when do you want them to just remember? New content. That's the first level. Can you think of other things? I'm thinking of spelling. <laughs> spelling In words. In elementary school, arithmetic facts. Right. Those are your building blocks, and that's what you have to do to start building. So there are times when that is exactly the level that you want. So let's look at the standard course of study then. If you look at your standard course of study, for science, and I'm going to pull in, I think we have K2, we have elementary, middle, and high school here presented. So let's pull up a standard. And I know you can't see it, but I'm going to talk to you about it. But if you go to any of your standards and read, you're going to see it heavily populated with Bloom's verbs. For example, Classify objects by observable physical properties. If I'm classifying, what level of blooms am I looking at? If I'm inferring, what level of blooms am I looking at? It is very important for you to understand, first of all, that when you're going through your standards, that you need to recognize the verbs. After recognizing the verbs, the next step is to look at what is it that I'm teaching in this content? What are the big rocks in it? What am I going to do with those verbs? Is it important for me to create? Am I summarizing? What am I doing? In science, what would be a good remembering objective or strategy? What do kids need to remember? Do they need to remember the table of elements? Do they need to be able to access, know where to access the table of elements? Uh-huh. And if you built up that level, what would be some creating? Would they might do some experiments or something like that that would be actually creating something? Some practices that would, where they would actually be doing something with that knowledge, that underlying knowledge. So to kind of break it down a little bit further, we've created four quiz questions. And we're going to use these questions to kind of explain to you revised blooms. So let's say you were to click on question one. And here's question one. Okay, students are to read a research article referencing a classroom experiment and summarize it in their own words. Which level of the Bloom ta Bloom's taxonomy does this represent? Is it A, understanding? Is it B, remember remembering? Or is it C, applying? A, thumbs up. A. Okay. Now, some of the things that you might want to consider when working with Bloom's understanding is question stems. Question stems that you might want to write are, can you explain why? Can you write in your own words how you explain? Can you write a brief outline? What do you think could have happened next? What do you think who do you think? What was the main idea? Can you clarify? Can you illustrate? Does everyone act in the same way 
that someone else does. So here are some types of question stems. Artifacts that you could use. If you're going to do an outline, think link R allows your students to create an outline. Question two. Students are assigned to read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks and asked to complete a series of tasks. And order the tasks from the lowest to the highest according to the revised Bloom's taxonomy. So you're going to look at the four options here. Out of the four, you're going to decide which would be the lowest level of understanding up to the highest level. Number one, the students will be asked to place the events in chronological order. Number two, write a new ending for the story. Number three, Choose one of the story's characters as a best friend and justify your choice. Or four, on what date did the story begin? Take a few minutes and write down the order that you think this would be placed in from lowest to highest. Do I need to repeat those choices? I can't see it, so it's kind of hard. <laughs> A, number one, replace the events in chronological order. Number two, write a new ending for the story. Number three, choose one of the story's characters as a best friend and justify your choice. Or four, on what date the story began. Out of those four, what is the lowest level? Four. Number four. Four. So you think D is the correct no. choice? She said four. Number four is the four. lowest level. So okay. that means it's either B or C. No. No? The answer is D. The answer is D, you think? No. Yes. For highest or lowest? Yeah, B. <laughs> okay, B says, four, on what date did the story begin? Which is number the first one, will be the lowest level. Number one, place the events in chronological order. Three, choose one of the story's characters as a best friend and justify the choice. Or two, what a new ending for the story. You said the answer is B? I agree. Either B. Yes. yes. B was the correct B. answer. <laughs> Again, the question it would help stems. If I could see it. <laughs> that was a good guess. <laughs> the PowerPoint will be made available will be made available to you. I'm sorry, let me do that. This PowerPoint will be made available to you and it's one that you can take back and use. Okay, let's look at three. Students will compare the structures and life functions of plant and animal cells, including major organelles, cell membrane, cell wall, nucleus, chloroplasts, mitochondria, and vacuoles. Which of the balloons does this represent? Good. Is it A, remembering, or B, understanding, or C, analyzing? Yes. B, like C. C. C? Who says, who says otherwise? No. You have anybody that disagrees? All right. C is correct. Again, <coughs> question stems for analyzing. What events? Could not have happened. 
What was the turning point? What are some of the problems of? You're analyzing something, so you're gonna be comparing something with something or looking at something compared to something else. Here are some tools that you can use. And again, we're gonna go back and go over some of these tools later. If you're doing a survey, Survey Monkey, Poll Everywhere, Database, Google Docs, Zoho, Outlines, Quick List, No Case, Outline Maker. If you're doing an abstract, Penzu, doing a graph, you do things like Create Graph, Chart Tool. Then Organize could be Bubbleus, it could be Mind Master. There are a series of tools that are out there. And then the final question. Students are asked to classify the items and diagrams as living or non-living. What is the level of student thinking? Is it A, understanding, B, applying, or C, evaluating? A. Okay, A, understanding. <laughs> Isn't it ranking? C. Okay. C. C. <laughs> it must be B. I think it might be B. The correct answer is applying. And what's the process you use for that? Process of elimination, right? <laughs> and applying, you're gonna, you're gonna ask things like, do you know of another instance where, can you group characteristics of, what factors could you change, and so forth and so on. Uh, artifacts, Photobold is a good tool that you can use, and Penzu is awesome. We're gonna look at Penzu later on. But wanted to kind of take you through the quiz to kind of give you an idea of some question stems, how to look at revised blooms and use it for creating questions, for creating lessons and activities in your classroom. There are several people who've done an excellent job in pulling together some resources and aligning them to blooms. I really like that one on the bottom down there. <laughs> Gail Holmes. Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start with, Wita. We're going to start with uh, Vicki Davis and Kathy Schrock, and then we're gonna land, we're gonna end up with Gail. Well, we're gonna start with Kathy, right? We're gonna start with Kathy. How many of you are familiar with Kathy Schrock? Who's not familiar? Who is, raise your hand if you've never heard of C C Kathy Schrock. Okay, find her on the internet. She's got all kinds of tools that she shares with everyone. And she's usually a regular at the, the state technology conferences. <coughs> okay, well, one of the it? things. How do you spell that? S C H R O C K. This wiki will be uploaded to. I mean, this PowerPoint will be uploaded to the wiki, and you can access it. Everything is hyperlinked. Can I explain it? You want me? Okay, this is an example of what Kathy Schrock has done. And she's taken blooms, and for each question, for each cognitive level of blooms, she's taken Google and matched it with the cognitive level. For example, if you wanted to focus on the recall of the remembering level, which is your lowest level, what kinds of things could you do? You could use Google Document. 
we can use Google Documents to help us list things because we know that with the remembering level, which is your recall level, one of the things that you're going to do is have students to list items. You could also use Google Draw. Google Draw is a graphic organizer that allows you to create mind maps on Google. These mind maps, can you can collaborate with other students so they could, could create theoretically one map together. She's also looked at the understand level, Google Translator, Google News. Now I know that in some schools that you may have things like Google blocked. Do you guys have access to all Google, all things Google in your school? Or do you block YouTube? She's also taken the cognitive level and aligned it to apps. So if you're looking for something, a good app that will list things, list is perfect. If you're looking for something to understand, then categorizing is a very good app. She's done this both, both for the iPhone as well as the Android. Okay. Now this is Kathy Schrock's work. Vicki Davis went a step further. And I think you will enjoy this one more so than what Kathy Schrock has done. Vicki Davis says that it's important for you to start with your standard. So if you click on that green section, you're typing your core text. This is your standard. You're going to look at what essential question am I focusing on here? You're starting with the end in mind. So think, for example, you might want to look at procedural knowledge. In procedural knowledge, you want, a, you want students to do a skill. You want them to create something. Or it may be the metacognitive knowledge. With the metacognitive knowledge, you're looking at how things in general break, how can you deconstruct something to understand the whole. You're looking at self-knowledge here. Factual knowledge, you're looking at vocabulary. What kinds of things can I do to help my students understand vocabulary? And then your conceptual knowledge. Now what she does is she takes each of those knowledge dimensions and says, okay, if I want my students to be able to evaluate, what am I actually asking them to do? So if you're evaluating, I can have them to work in writing groups and then give feedback to their peers. I can have them listen to a political speech and make a list of contradictions on why they agree or not agree with that speech. And then she goes to the activity level and she says, okay, here are the verbs that you're going to focus on. Here are some activities that you can participate in or have your students participate in. You can have them to create a debate using word processing and a sound recorder. You can have them do podcasting, broadcasting. You can have them do instant messaging. Again, here's a list of just a lot of activities that you can integrate to help those students master a concept. And then what I looked at was 
taking those tools, looking at the cognitive level, breaking it down so that you can see both the cognitive and the knowledge level, and then looking at what tools are out there for us to use. How many of you have heard of Quizlet before? Rachel, have you heard of Quizlet or used Quizlet before? How many of you used Penzoo before? Let's look at Wordle, Taggle. How many of you use Wordle and Taggle? Or Bokaroo? Now, we don't want to look at this as being a workshop just on tools because that's not the point. The point is, if I want my students to remember, what tools could I create or allow them to create so that they could practice? If I wanted them to learn how to spell a word, wouldn't they be more, much more excited if they could spell those words in a recorder and listen back to it themselves at home with their MP3 players? What tools are available to do that? If I wanted them to collaborate, I could use a voice thread. So I'm going to look at Penzo. With Penzo, there's a diary. Now, in my chemistry class in high school, one of the things that my chemistry teacher had us to do was keep a chemistry notebook. In that chemistry notebook, we had to create our diagrams, and anything that we did in his class had to be placed in that notebook. The purpose was to use that notebook at the end of the year as a study guide so that we could be successful in our end-of-year test. With Penzu, look at this as your end-of-year study guide. If the students went into their journal and reflected on their journal on a daily basis, this would be an excellent way for them to keep a record of weekly assignments, strategies that they've learned, resources that you have shared with them. This is their knowledge book that they carry with them. Now, we know that everyone doesn't have access to the computer and that this is not something that you can do if you don't have access to the computer. But your, your Penzu could be, again, your notebook. It could be, if the students have cell phones, it could be their cell phones, keeping notes. With Penzu here, every time I put a recording, it classifies that recording according to the title, and the date. So I can go back at any time and look at the information that I typed on a given date. I can read it and reflect on it. Think about your classrooms. And even if you only had one computer in your classroom, how could you use Penzu to summarize the information that you've taught? And instead of you having to sit at the computer and type that information yourself, could you not bring in one student and have that student for that day responsible for recording or summarizing that day's lesson? That lesson is now summarized for those students who've been absent is summarized for those students, especially for that student who did the summary, he's getting a second ounce of that information, so he's going to remember it. Because it's online, they can go back and read it at any time. Think about what you teach, and how could you use Penzu in your classroom? Give me some feedback. Put your hands together and discuss it for a moment. <clears throat> How could you make Penzu work in your learning environment? 
we could do journals. You might be able to take notes on it during the day. Okay. What else could you do? What about homework? What about emailing it to your parents to let them know what you did in class that day? Is Penzu accessible by anyone? If if the teacher had the one account and students wrote in daily, you know, there's summarizing of what happened in class for others, then can anyone access it? Just like a diary, you can lock it or you can have it open. Okay. So it's optional. But it's a good way. I mean, it, we know that it's so important to bring our parents into our classrooms. And at the same time, we know that our parents have to work. So what tools are available to allow them to see what we're actually doing? You have kids that will go home and say, I don't have any homework. You put your homework in this diary. At the end of the day, this is what we've done. This is what your students are expected to do for homework. It's a way of engaging everybody. Penzu. Another tool that I've used that I think would be excellent is called Tricider. The neat thing about this tool is students do not have to register to use it. It allows you to collaborate on it, brainstorm on it. So let's say that I wanted you, and I've created one for you guys, to share an idea with me. And I'm going to go to the wiki for a moment. This is Tricider. I can post a question, and I know you may not be able to read it, but I'm going to explain it how it works. With Tricider, the teacher or student or anyone can create a question. In this case, the question is, what issues are preventing you from effectively embedding technology into your curriculum? You can add an idea. So if you wanted to respond to this question, you'd simply click on add an idea, and you would add an idea to this post. You can add as many ideas as you'd like to. Once you have all of your ideas posted, then others can come in and vote on it. Let's say we were voting on whether or not we wanted to have ice cream in the classroom. We're going to have an ice cream party. You're going to give the kids ice cream. And you had five flavors of ice cream. And you wanted them to vote on which flavor was the best. So you could have a list. Everyone could come in and throw in their flavor of ice cream. And then students can vote on the flavor that they prefer. So think about how you can start with just a list and build up to a higher order thinking by having students to do different things with this one activity. Think about just listing things and have them to categorize it into living and non-living things. And all you have to do is put that link and they will simply type in that information. So you, you throw out the idea, they build on it. It's called Tricider. How many of you have used Lenoit before? Another tool that students do not have to log on to. It is a perfect teaching tool. With Lenoit, I can, with the sticky notes, allow my students to respond to a lesson. They can share ideas. If I want to tempt them to look at an activity that I have created, 
through a video. I can upload a video. If I wanted to, them to download a document that I was including in my lesson, I can upload that document, they can download that document for use. So we can start with the lowest level of the revised blooms, which is a list. And then we can actually have students to create their own Linode if we chose to go that route and create some type of activity based on the concept that we're teaching in the classroom. The neat thing about this is it's a collaborative tool. It's an interactive tool. I can put students in groups and while they're working in groups, they can collaborate on this too at their seats no matter where they're sitting in the classroom. Especially if you have three or four computers in the classroom or you have access to three or four computers. So I can create my activity. I do not have to have a computer lab to use this tool and make it work. Think about Linoid for a second. How can you empower students? How can you strengthen your lesson using this tool? Take a few minutes, minutes and think about that and respond to it. Yes? Okay, give me some feedback. How could you use this tool in your classroom? We're having difficulty hearing the name of the website. Could you repeat the name of the website, please? L-I-N-O-I-T dot com. Can you see it? Okay. Now, how could you work with this tool in your classroom? Think about what you're already doing. <clears throat> Posting daily assignments. Posting daily assignments. What else? This would be a situation where you could do some formative assessment and allow the kids to give you, um, this is what I was unclear on. Could you reteach this possibly and have the kids give you feedback? Awesome. Excellent. Excellent strategy. What other things could you do with it? How about a gallery walk? A gallery walk, very good. How about a parking lot? Parking lot. At the end of the day, you always have those kids who are confused. You bring this Lenoid back up at the end of the day, look at it, because the Lenoid could be something they could do at home. You know, they go home, they have access to a computer, they may type in a, a question that, that asks the teacher uh, to clarify the homework assignment. You know, I'm confused. I really can't do this. My mother can't help me. You can also use this as a tool to share a, a recording so that the students can go back, look at it, and get procedures for completing a task. One last tool I want to share with you because I, don't, I know my time is ending. It's Bokaroo. And that is wrong. B A is that B A C R? B A C R O O. I'm in back. Dot com. It's not over here on this side window. Search it on Google. recording you have all your parents email addresses and you want to send them a quick email with your voice recorded 
explaining something wonderful that that child did in school that day. You know, I had one of those kids that if the teacher called, I knew it was going to be bad news. <laughs> and so it's always good every now and then to get a message from the teacher saying, I just wanted you to know that you have a wonderful child and he did some good things in class today. You click on record, you type your, you record your message straight through <coughs> this tool, and then you email it to whomever you choose to email it to. And it's as simple as that. You don't have to spend a whole lot of time, and especially think about those parents who just cannot come to school because they have to work. How grateful will they be that you took the time to send them a personal message? And you could, in some cases, create one email and use it for several parents if you don't put in the child's name. But if you want to personalize it, then let that child's name be included. The goal is to build capacity the goal is to engage your parents because if you have happy parents, they're gonna work with you and eventually you will have happy students, we hope. At least you'll have students who will behave in class, we hope. And the last thing I wanna share with you because I know my time is ending. And again, all of this will be on the wiki that I've shared with you earlier. I've been working on a toolkit with the goal to be able to bring together resources that focuses on revised blooms. So here you will see the verb, the question stems that you might consider asking, some artifacts that you could have students create, and finally, hyperlinks to websites that you can click on and use them as tools to meet the goals of that stem or that verb. You have both the wiki site and the PowerPoint available to you. And again, the PowerPoint will be uploaded to the wiki site that I gave you earlier. Are there any last minute questions or comments? Show me the wiki site. Show me the wiki site. You want to bring up that slide that has the wiki site URL on it again? Okay, the URL for the wiki. I'm bringing it up for you now. And if you go to the wiki site, there is a link to a Lenore that says reflections. If you have any follow-up questions that you'd like to ask, post them on that Lenore and I'll respond to them there. Tell them to put their email address. <laughs> Make sure you include your email address when you post the question. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you.